It is 2021 and you might be wondering why are we still teaching RSA in a cryptology course? I mean, we have seen a lot of curve cryptography and that's certainly the preferred building block for any crypto system on the internet that needs public key cryptography. We still see a lot of signatures using RSA. So if you look at your browser and the certificate chain, then you're likely going to see RSA. But already for PGP keys or for SSH keys, we're seeing more and more at 2519, which was a signature system, which we covered earlier. Now, one reason to cover RSA is that hilariously much can go wrong, which is not a good reason to use it in practice, but it's a very nice reason for, well, student apprentice cryptographers to look into RSA because you can sharpen your claws, you can figure out all the things that can go wrong. And a lot has gone wrong. So if you look back at problems with non-randomness, so in 2004, um, Bauer and Lowry were looking at a whole bunch of PGP keys. Now, 18,000 might not strike you as much, but it was a bit more niche back then. And so they took one of the key servers, I think it was the MIT key server, and looked at all the PGP RSA keys. And I had motivated that there are enough primes for everybody. Now I did this for 4096-bit uh, moduli, but even if you do this for 1024-bit moduli, it was more common then, you will not gonna find repeating factors. However, they found two keys that shared a factor. Fast forward by eight years, 2012, there were actually two groups that did the internet on a that did the experiment on an internet-wide scale. So they downloaded a whole bunch of certificates. And they also downloaded the PGP keys and whatever other keys they could find for good measure. And they factored thousands, tens of thousands of public keys. Now, okay, these are not the certificates of your bank. These are not the certificates of TUE or my webpage or something. But these are typically keys for home routers. So these are kind of small set-up boxes which were not well maintained, maybe just factory initials, but... Hmm, Yes, that part, the factory initialization explains why they would have the same key. Not a good idea. The device should generate their own key. But actually many shared one prime factor and not both, which is why you could actually factor them. I mean, it, okay, if you share a key with somebody else, you can decrypt each other messages because, I mean, you have the same P and Q if you have the same N. But the dangerous thing about RSA is that if you share one prime factor, well, both of those pieces factor. So both public keys, if they overlap on one prime, they factor, and this really shouldn't happen. Now, the most common problem in all of those were that, well, OpenSSL wanted to have randomness, drew from DefU random, and somehow something got stuck. And, well, they didn't really wait for Def random to wake up, and so, well, in the end, they took something which didn't have much entropy. In particular, at that point, um, Debian had, or Linux had disabled certain of the inputs, so for things which didn't have a hard drive but only an SSD, there wasn't actually much coming in. There were no keyboard strokes on a setup router, uh, in, a, in a home router, and there was no internet package arriving that because, well, it was just booted. But also, just now, two days ago, I posted the, um, the link to the Git card bug, which is again something where the entropy is too low, and so suddenly, People share keys. Now what we know from these 2012 cases looks like this. So they found a bunch of um, internet mo uh, RSA moduli, P1, PQ, P1, P, uh, P2, PQ, and so on. And now here, look at this one. Okay, I put P4, but then I'm repeating Q2. And okay, that shouldn't happen, but these overlap on Q2. And so if I would be doing something like that, obviously, I could take uh, GCDs between pairs of those, then I would find uh, Q2 as a shared factor if I'm looking at N2 and N4. And if I find a shared factor, if I find Q2, I also find P2 and P4. And maybe those appear somewhere else as well. Um, of course, if you're doing that on an internet scale, you actually might want to invest a bit more time because doing pairwise GCDs is too much. There's a faster algorithm called scaled remainder trees. So should you find yourself ever in a situation where you're doing this, well, check the literature. This is not too unlikely that you find yourself doing this. At least around 2012, these were lots of student projects. Also here at Eindhoven, we had a student project just looking into, well, doing this with some other keys, either replicating this or using some other database of keys. 
Well, one thing that I was involved in is the example where we actually found share primes from certified smart cards. Now, to understand the highlighting of certified here is that normally smart cards go through a lot more vetting, like more thorough security review than your random router. So anybody can produce a router and put it somewhere, but if you have a smart card which is meant for citizen identification or for banking application, those actually go through quite a bit of testing, both for well correctness of the implementation, security of the implementation, and even site channel attacks. And so finding that this could happen with a shared prime was actually quite surprising. Now I came in later. Our friends, uh, colleagues from Taiwan, had already done the, the download the database and done all the GCDs, and they had found something on the scale of 109 shared keys. On a database of thousands of keys, like a million or so, but the interesting thing was this. You were looking at these shared factors. Now I have to explain you a little bit what this picture shows. No, it's not a pretty picture with flowers or something. This is actually um, each of those bubbles here shows a P with a number after it, which is the prime number. Well, this is P40 and it has connections to P80 and P90, uh, P84 and P90. So this prime was shared in this modulus and this modulus. Or for instance, here we have one which is used in six different moduli. And so we plotted this once we got their results and we're like, what is going on here? What is this prime P110 in the middle here? This is really the prime that's getting all the Facebooks friends. I mean, that gets so many likes. I mean, okay, these got a whole bunch of partners as well, here as well. But this, this got all the likes on Facebook. Now let's look at this P110. This appears 46 times. So let's look at this prime. So here's the prime in hexadecimal. Remind you, C, that is 1100, zero, zero, and then down here, oh, well, there's a whole bunch of zeros, and it's 2F9. We can verify this thing is prime. I think that's the best you can say about it. Um, other than that, you get this prime as the next prime after taking 2 to the 511 plus 2 to the 510. So all the numbers that were affected were uh, 512 bit primes, so these were somewhat older keys where the n was 1024 bits, and so each of the primes had 511 bits, 512 bits, top two bits set. So this was weird. I mean, that prime wouldn't appear by random. I mean, if somebody asks you, hey, give me a prime which satisfies that the top two bits are set and that it's a prime, you might pick this one, but you wouldn't pick this if you were a certified, certified smart card. And then also the next prime, Next most common factor repeated seven times, one of the feet of this flower picture. Also there you, like if you stare at this, you're seeing lots of runs. There's like 249, 492, um, and many of the other factors also have these patterns. So we're like, how oh, this is odd. This didn't appear in any of the other examples. So in the, in the two teams on 2012, there was no pattern in these primes. And in the smart cars, there suddenly was a pattern. So we, we got really interested and well looked at these and eventually we figured out what this pattern was. So here let me write it in binary. And also, okay, remember up here there's two ones because this is typically what you want on the in for primes and RSA keys to make sure that the product has full length. You want to set the two top bits. And remember that the bottom here, well, doesn't follow the pattern because well, you want a prime. Now, ignoring those and then swapping every 16-bit in a 32-bit word. It took us a while to come up with this, but well, align these on 16 bits for well swapping into the top half, bottom half. Now, this here, this part was the bottom half of this word. And so this blue part, which is the thing that we get for making the number prime, appears in some positions that don't make sense with the pattern. And also there. And then you stare at this and like, oh, okay, 001, 001, 001, ah, interesting. So apparently, let's align this a little bit. This is 
a pattern which, apart from these blue bits, applies to the whole 512 bits. And each of these 119 keys that were affected had at least one prime factor which exhibited such a pattern. Now, not all of those had a pattern of period 3, so this one is 001, 001, so a pattern of length 3. Uh, some of them had pattern of length 1, like the all zeros. We also saw an all 1 pattern. We saw some patterns of length 5 and length 7. And so we're like, yeah, what are the chances? So, okay, let's speculate that the prime generation worked as follows. You pick a bit pattern, you repeat it all the way till you have 512 bits, uh, you, you truncate to exactly 512, then you do the swap for the top and bottom part. This actually sort of makes sense if you look at how these numbers would be generated and how you would be assigning them something, so step two. We want to put the two top bits to one one, and then we increment at the bottom till we find a prime. So, well, I told you, you can't find primes other than just picking random numbers, and here is a way to find primes. Actually, this way to find primes has as much success chance as any. I mean, incrementing or just trying from scratch, um, that wouldn't help either because, I mean, this, this doesn't give you primes any faster. You still have to do as about log of the size many steps. Also, there's a lot of fine print here. We understand that this is not what they're meant to do. What apparently happened is that they were using a random number generator, which got stuck, which never actually woke up. It was in some test pattern or in some self-test pattern, which would be these length 1, 3, 5, or 7. And they were already asking it for real randomness when it was still in these self-tests. And then the other thing were um, the company said it was done by human error. So, um, well, if anybody ever asks you, what do you want? True randomness or pseudo-randomness? Chances are that you feel like, hey, one true randomness, that must be the right thing. Unfortunately, when you're dealing with cryptography and someone gives you true randomness, that can be very heavily biased. So, when you get a proper entropy source, it is just saying that it is having enough randomness in there. It doesn't mean that, say, zeros are as frequent as, as ones. It doesn't mean that it's kind of nice. You will probably still have to widen it. And in cryptography, we say widen if we kind of throw, say, a block cipher to it. So normally we run this through some AES or some other pseudo-random number generator with its input in order to smoothen out whatever bias is there. Well, they were using the true random number generator output, which unfortunately on top of everything else had gotten stuck. So there were two bad things. A, the smart card had gotten stuck. And B, they were not using AES on it. The 119 keys, those would have been found anyway. Because if, this, if the RNG is stuck, no matter how nicely you widen it, you would still get the same keys. That's the same thing as you would now see, as you just now saw with the Git carton, or as you saw in 2012 with all the experiments on the internet. The exciting part about this one is that they also didn't widen it, and so we could really see the pure output from this RNG, which had all these patterns. And that allowed us to have a lot more fun. So, well, let's break some more keys. So, well, I told you that factoring by trial division is actually not the worst idea. And in this case, well, if you see some patterns of lengths 1, 3, 5, and 7, but we didn't see all of those, maybe maybe we just try some more. So, okay, we had seen everything for the patterns of lengths 0 and 1, but we could try some more of the lengths 3 patterns. I don't think we had actually seen all of these 6. And then lengths 5, we definitely didn't see all of lengths 7. So we went through those. For each of those generated whatever prime would come out of it and yep we found 18 new moduli actually from computing the gcds with these primes and all the a million moduli that we had we found 105 now most of these 105 were the things we had seen already which is why we got this hypothesis um, that there is well something going on with these uh, with these patterns but we also found some 18 more well, 
if you have length seven patterns, how about you look for length nine patterns? Uh, yeah, we broke RSA 1034 by trial division. We looked for patterns of length nine, we factored four more keys, and um, this is the end for this video. But there's a sneak preview because these numbers are so nicely patterned. Well, first of all, we got 27 extra keys, but also we could do some more mathy attacks, which, um, well, had been often stated, but were rarely, um, well, at that point had never been found in the wild. Um, and well, our paper was the first to show how to use them. So, well, stay tuned for the next one.